Hey, everybody, welcome to our virtual Bible study. Thank you for tuning in. We are so excited to get together and study the Bible like this. And we're very grateful that in His great providence, God has allowed human wisdom and technology to develop to the point that we can we can be together like this, even if we can't be together in person. Now, there's no substitute for being together in person. Sometimes people are away or they're sick, or shut in, whatever it may be, or you might be out of the area and you still like to watch our program. We are so glad you could tune in. Real quick, before I explain what we're doing tonight, uh, can I remind you, if you're on our YouTube channel, please uh, give us a thumbs up, but also hit the subscribe button below the video, and that's going to help you out a bunch. It's going to help us out a bunch. We try to boost the visibility that we have on YouTube, and if you can help us out by hitting the subscribe button, watching the videos as they come in, that will help us a lot. Also, if you can, uh, if you're on Facebook, if you can share this on your timeline, that would help us a lot too, uh, because I've tried to explain it before. It's you know, it's people are like, well, I mean, you're on Facebook, yeah, but we're a public page, and the, the only way people can see us is if they like the North Hamilton page on Facebook. So if you share the video on your timeline, then all of the people who are on your friends list who could not formally see our videos can now see the video. So if you'll share the video, we would greatly appreciate your help doing that. So tonight, today, this lesson, we are in lesson number 12. And I want to explain what we're doing here. Uh, if you were with us from the beginning, we kind of detailed where we were heading in this study. And in the original lesson number 12, which is going to come, uh, it'll just be numbered differently when we get there, we were going to be in manners and customs and talking about some other practical matters toward the end of our study, because we originally intended this to be like a 13-lesson study. Not 13 weeks. We're never going to be. Is ne nothing's ever going to be 13 weeks when we jump into it. It's always going to extend beyond that. But 13 lessons. That's a that's a good number, at least for a quarter type study. And I didn't add some things at the beginning that I want to add now in our study. And we've done that. We did that last week, or in the last lesson. I say last week. This is uh, archived, so you could watch it anytime. Uh, but in lesson number 11, we dealt with types. Types and typology, right? Type-anti-type -type relationships in the Bible as one of the figures of speech that the Bible uses to convey truth to us. So that was an add-on. And I don't want to leave the figure of speech section without just addressing some regular figures of speech that we see in the Bible that we haven't mentioned already. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on each of these, but in the next lesson, and in this lesson, uh, we're just going to talk about some additional language features that we see in the Bible. It's part of the way God communicates to us. And those are things like allegory, and proverbs, and synecdoche, and metonymy, and, and, a, and a number of other things like this. Right. So when you're reading the book of Acts, and the Bible says, and there were... Uh, Many who were baptized, not a few. What does he mean by that? That's a figure of speech. It's a way of talking. It actually has a, a proper hermeneutical name. Uh, we'll talk about those things tonight in this lesson. I keep saying tonight um, because it airs when a class would air in the evening, but it could be any time that you're watching this, maybe in the morning time that you're watching it. In lesson number 12, this lesson, lesson number 12, we're going to be talking about allegories, in the Bible, we're going to talk about metonymy and synecdoche. Now, those sound like huge jaw-breaking terms, and they are for the most part. They're sort of transliterations of joint Greek terms. I'll explain all of that. And if we have time, we're going to talk about Proverbs. So that's four things. And if you're a regular viewer of this program, we don't cover one thing very quickly, and four things really quickly is almost impossible, but we're going to do our best to get four things uh, this, in this lesson. All right, so number one, allegory. What in the world is an allegory? 
Uh, this would be the word, if I had this down on my paper and I had it laying open at my house, my kids would go, are you talking about allergies? Nope, talking about allegories. And there are allegories in the Bible. Okay, there are allegories in Scripture. An allegory is formed from two Greek words, and I'm not going to go over the Greek words. I like to make notes as we go along. Uh, the first part of the word is the word that means other, and the second part of the term, the, the real bulk of the word, is the word that means to speak in the assembly or to harangue. So this occurs when one story is told in place of another, right? There's a, there's a telling of a story. It's almost like a parable. In, in a way, it's a lot like a parable. There's a story that's being told, and there are meanings beyond the actual story that's being told. There are meanings, like heavenly meanings, just like a parable, that are being placed into the story. So an allegory is a story consisting of arranged metaphors, often called an extended metaphor. And it is a figurative application of real facts. Or it might take and use real people and intertwine them in a story, um, sort of a fictional story, to make a point about real facts um, and heavenly truths. Again, they're very similar to parables. Uh, there are some who have mistakenly called allegories, parables, and scriptures. That's how close they are, but here's the difference. In a parable, generally in a parable, you have one singular, main, exclusive point the parable is trying to make. So, for example, in the parable of the ten virgins, one of my favorites, one of my kids' favorites, Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through verse 13, I think, there's one main point to that parable. Watch. Be, be ready. Stay on alert because you never know when the Lord is going to come back in His judgment. You just never know. So be alert and stay ready. That's the main point. Now, there might be some other points you could make from the parable, but the main point is to stay ready. In Matthew 20, first 16 verses, I think it is, 1 through 16, um, he's answering Peter's question, who in the former chapter said, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. What are we going to have? You know, Because this is following the rich young ruler who walked away from Jesus because he had great possessions. And Peter was essentially saying, we're going to get more, right? Because we've been with you longer from the very beginning. We get the most. And Jesus tells the parable about the laborers going into the vineyard for a penny a day and how those that went out at 6 in the morning got a penny a day and how those that went out at the 11th hour, 5 p.m., got a penny for their work. Because it's not, about, it's not about seniority, it's about service. And that's why he'll say at the end um, about basically saying it's, it's not about the time of service, which is important. I mean, obviously, we want to serve God to the, for, the, for as many days as we can do that. But he's saying if, for, if for, say, for example, somebody comes in and they truly obey the gospel and they've not been a Christian as long, they're still going to be rewarded. They're still going to gain heaven as a result of that. Okay? Those are parables, and they have a singular truth. That's the singular truth in that parable. Uh, just like the one in Matthew 25, the singular truth about being watchful and be ready. Allegories can have a lot of points of comparisons, and generally they do. There's just lots of points, and the whole point of an allegory is to make numerous comparisons between the two of those. So just be aware of that. Now, let's talk about a couple of rules for allegories. They're not very difficult because if you can interpret a parable, you can certainly inter interpret an allegory um, with everything we do. Number one, context, the most important thing, especially historical context. You want to read the history because there's, there are usually allusions to his, history. There's historical references within allegories, and you want to try to be aware of how history can help complete the word picture. Um, number two, distinguish the literal from the figurative because there are obviously literal parts and figurative parts, and determine the reason that the allegory is being given in the first place. What's the application of it? Why is the writer giving us this? Then I would suggest this, and it's not a hard, fast rule, but I just think it's really helpful. Make a list of the comparisons between the two things that are being um, compared. And then, uh, number four, don't add explanation where God 
hasn't given explanation. God's explanation is always sufficient, all sufficient, and it's always right. And people get in trouble, I think, sometimes when they start adding to parables, adding to figures of speech, adding to allegories in this case, and it just leads to trouble. God's explanation is always the best one. Whatever he says it's meant to say, that's it. Okay, so some examples. I'm just going to look at one, but I'll refer you to a, a few more. Psalm 80, verses 8 through 15. Psalm 80, verses 8 through 15, if you're taking notes. There's, a, there's an allegory there. Read that. Take a look and see what you think about that. Ephesians 6, verses 11 through 18. That's an allegory. Put on the whole armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth. Well, what does, a, what does a breastplate do? Because there's obviously some metaphor being used to teach me something about righteousness. And there's something about a belt that's being used to teach me something about truth. And my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, if I look at a Roman soldier's footwear, there's probably a lesson I could learn about the preparation for preaching the truth in the soldier's footwear. Why did he wear that? See how that works? Same thing is true of Galatians chapter 4. Now, this one I want to read. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 22. All right, so if you've got your Bible, Galatians 4, and look at verse 22. I want to read this allegory, and then we'll just quickly go through the comparisons. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. He doesn't use the word allegory in translation, but he's telling us these are metaphors. They're being used metaphorically. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. It corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the woman, uh, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now that's without considering considering the context, that might sound like a really weird story. And I don't mean weird like in why did God write that? I just mean like hard to interpret story. Because why would He be saying these things? Well, what you have in this passage is a contrast between Judaism and Christianity. The whole book of Galatians is essentially about that, where he's been saying, don't go back under Judaism. You're Christians. That's his whole point in chapter 3 when he said, you became children of God by the faith. You were baptized into Christ. The law didn't require that, but Christianity does. The New Testament does. So this whole allegory is a comparison, and in many ways a contrast between Judaism and Christianity. For example, Hagar is representative of Judaism. Sarah represents Christianity. Ishmael was part of the representation of Judaism, who was a slave. Isaac is free. He represents Christianity. He's free. The birth of uh, the birth of the uh, Hagar's birth of Ishmael was natural, whereas there was the providential work of God and the promise of God involved in the birth of uh, of Isaac. Um, in, in comparing those two, you would see one is the fulfillment of the other, right? So one, Christianity is the real, and, and Judaism was sort of a foreshadowing of the one. You have a contrast between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, a contrast between earthly Jerusalem and New Jerusalem, which is the church, a contrast between the small offspring and the big offspring, which would mean the uh, numberless, the inability to number the people who are members of the church, because you always have everyday people coming in, some leaving and such, uh, you have a contrast between the one doing the persecuting and the one persecuted, the church being the persecuted. The one doing the expulsion and the one who is receiving the inheritance, that's Christianity, and then bondage versus freedom. 
That's what allegories do. They don't just make one point. They make many points. And that's why I think they're sometimes easy to identify because of how many points they intend to make. And that's what Galatians 4, or why Galatians 4 is a really great example of an allegory. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, I promise. We would other things, but not this. Okay, so quick, move on to the next. Number two, metonymy. That's just, it sounds crazy hard to understand, but metonymy is not hard to understand. You see it all the time in Scripture. We're just trying to point it out so that we're much more aware of it and can read it better. Metonymy is formed from two Greek words, one meaning change, meta meaning change, and anoma uh, meaning name. So it's a change of name is what a metonymy is. This deals with relationships between objects. That's what metonymy does. Two things that are related to each other and occurs when the name of one thing is applied to another because of the relationship that those two things bear. And there are a couple of categories of these generally. There's usually cause or effect or subject and the adjunct. Right? Something always is in relationship to another. Uh, for example, uh, Cause can be put for effect, or effect can be put for cause. Um, the subject can be put for the adjunct, the adjunct for the subject. That's the way metonymy works in Scripture. I would like to give an example of that. So let's look at some examples. There are times when the cause is put for the effect. right? And a great example of that will be Luke 16. Luke chapter 16. And in this account, when Jesus is telling us about the rich man and Lazarus who end up in the Hadean realm, the rich man is trying to, he's begging Abraham to do something about his physical brethren back on earth because he doesn't want them to come to the same place. And Abraham's telling him, no, they've, they've got the word of God. They need to listen to the word of God. And so in verse 31, he says this, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets... Neither will they be persuaded the one rise from the dead. Now, nobody's coming back from the dead, but how on earth can people who are alive today hear Moses and the prophets? Moses died. The prophets are all dead. How can they hear them? In fact, Moses would be in paradise where Lazarus was, and the prophets, those that were faithful, would be in paradise where where the rich or where uh, Lazarus was. So, how is it possible to receive Moses and the prophets? They're receiving the effect of Moses and the prophets. Their writings. The Word of God, what they preserved by inspiration in the written book that we have today, right? So Abraham is saying, they've got the Word of God, and if they're not going to listen to the Word of God, then they're not going to listen if somebody were to be raised from the dead. So here, cause is put for effect. The Bible often does that. Another example be would be when a progenitor, when a progenitor, a parent, for example, is put in place of his children or his descendants. How often in the Bible would God, especially in the prophets, refer to Jacob? Well, Jacob's dead. Well, what does he mean by Jacob? He means Israel. And he doesn't mean Israel as in Jacob. He means the descendants of Israel. So the name of the progenitor, Israel, because he doesn't say Israelites. He does sometimes. But often he'll say Israel. That's Jacob. But he stands in place of his descendants. So he's defer, referring to the descendants of him. And then sometimes a sign can be put for the thing that is signified. And I'll just give a quick example of that because I really do want to move on. Romans chapter 3 verse 30, uh, he'll talk about the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Well, who does he mean by that? Well, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. And in the New Testament, you often have reference to circumcised and uncircumcised to draw the difference between Gentiles and Jews. So you have the sign, circumcision, put for the thing signified, the, the Jews who were circumcised according to the law. They, were, they did that. Um, that's how metonymy works in the Bible. It's fun. I love metonymy, I think. And you probably do too. We just never really formally called it metonymy. But it's fun when we see those because we go, oh, yeah, he's talking about this. He's, he says the name Jacob, but he's talking about the descendants of Jacob here. Or he says Moses and the prophets, but he really means the writings of Moses and the prophets. That's what's implied in that. That's metonymy. Now, a couple of rules for metonymy. We always want to keep context in mind. Context is super important, really, really important. Um, 
I have found, this is just my, my thinking on this, uh, I have found that if there are parallel passages that are available that talk about the same thing, it usually helps me to understand if I'm stuck on a metonymy somewhere. Like, what's he really, what's, you know, I know he's using this, but what's the relationship that he means this other thing? Parallel passages help with that. And then I would add the most natural meaning is often the, the correct meaning. Truth is common sense. It's why God wrote it. It's meant to make sense to us. It's meant to appeal to our common sense. It's written for babes, according to Matthew eleven twenty five, not for the wise and the prudent. It's not you don't have to have a string of PhDs behind your name to understand truth. You just have to use your common sense. And if we're reading in context and we're keeping the context, things usually make sense because of common sense. So apply common sense. The natural meaning is often the correct meaning. Now let's talk about synecdoche. And looking at time, I'm sorry, it's probably, this is probably going to be our last one. I don't know. We'll see. Synecdoche. What is synecdoche? Because we don't talk like that, and we don't use the word metonymy. They're really similar. They're different in one way, and we're, I'm about to talk about that. They're a little different in Scripture, but they're, they're very similar. So sometimes people confuse metonymy and synecdoche, but we'll explain it and use some examples. Hopefully it makes sense. So synecdoche, uh, this is from two Greek words. The first meaning with or together with, which is a little uh, preposition used up front. And then you have the primary word that means the act or the manner of receiving from or reception. So one is receiving from another. And it has come to denote, synecdoche, uh, synecdoche has come to denote a word or idea that receives something um, from or is exchanged with a related word or concept. Now that may not make so much sense. Um, it's very again, it's very much like metonymy, and it typically occurs when one word is placed in another to represent the other. So it would be easy to confuse them because there's generally relationships between the two. They just they're much more distinct. I think synecdoche appears much more distinctly in Scripture. So, for example, one of the ways that synecdoche is used is when a part is put for, uh, or a whole is put for a part, right? So you have a whole thing that represents only a part of the thing, if that makes sense. And I'm, I'm going to illustrate it. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. If you'll turn your Bible to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. All right. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Or some versions may still say taxed, but registered. Um, it was, there was part of a census going on in verse 2, if you'll read that. So the registration was part of the census process. So they go for the census. All the world should be registered. All, all the world? What about the parts that weren't in Roman control? No. What he means here is all is everything that fell within Roman control. All the Roman provinces were required for registration, and everything that was a subsidiary of that, everything that was subjugated to Rome. But there were parts of the world that Rome did not control. Now, they tried, but they didn't control certain parts of the world, and those people surely didn't register, and that decree didn't go to them. So... The idea is that you have the whole, all the world, is now put for a part when it says uh, the Roman provinces. And there are lots of, lots of places in the Bible that do uh, exactly the same thing. Um, how about this? How about this? Just thinking out loud. I didn't put this in my notes. In fact, I'm going to jot it down real quick. I'm going to put Mark 16. 15, because this is synecdoche, we have the same thing. He said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature? You Do you mean elephants and giraffes? Those are creatures. Well, no, he means the human population, right? Those that are made in the image of God. Those who have the capacity of moral altness and intellect and will and emotion and have souls that can be affected redemptively. So what you have when he says all creatures, you have a whole being put for a part. And that's the way we understand it. 
and people we just we don't read the word synecdoche we don't say that but that's what that's what you're seeing right here is synecdoche sometimes the part is put for the whole so instead of the whole for the part now you have a little part being put for something much uh, much bigger an example of this would be acts chapter 20 acts chapter 20 i think this is a, a good example of a synecdoche where a part is put for a whole Acts 20, verse 7, when it says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Now, the breaking of the bread here is the Lord's Supper. That's consistent language in the New Testament for the Lord's Supper. The breaking of the bread is the Lord's Supper. But now there's two elements in the Lord's Supper, right? There's the bread and then there's the fruit of the vine. Well, I didn't say the fruit of the vine. Well, it's implied, but he's using synecdoche. You have a part being put for the whole. The whole supper is mentioned here. They didn't do one part of the Lord's Supper. They did it all. But a part is being placed for a whole. That's how it works. Uh, I jotted down some other examples. Um, sometimes um, another example would be I put uh, some, some of the uses of time. Sometimes time is a, uh, part of time can be put for whole or um, a whole for part of time. Time is put for a part of time is how that works in Scripture. And sometimes it will be rounded when you're really close to a number. Like they, the Israelites walked the desert for 40 years. 40 years they walked in the desert. If you calculate the time, precisely it was about 38 and a half years. But that's basically 40 years. So time is put for part of time. The Bible works like that, just like we do the same thing today. Uh, another example would be when a singular is put for a plural. A singular is put for a plural. Um, do you remember when... In the book of Exodus, when they crossed the Red Sea, God brought them through the Red Sea. And in Exodus chapter 15, they're going to celebrate. And in verse 1, it says, Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he's thrown into the sea. Did he only put one horse and one rider at the bottom of the sea? No, he put the army of Egypt at the bottom of the sea. But the, but the singular here is put for the plural, right? That's synecdoche. Uh, sometimes an individual will be put for a class of people. And I, a great example of that is when the Bible refers to Pharaoh. Uh, the children of Israel were much grieved because of Pharaoh. Well, it was really the Egyptians. Pharaoh was the leader. He was the king. But the Egyptians themselves weren't kind to the Israelites. Or to God's, but the Hebrews, they weren't kind to God's people. And in Romans 9, 17, when it talks about Pharaoh, Pharaoh stands as a representative of Egypt, representative of Egypt. And sometimes we'll see that in the Bible. Or where a definite is put for an indefinite, right? So Jesus did this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 22, when he says, I say up to 490 times. Well, not literally, but he meant as often as is necessary, you'll do this to forgive. And so that is when a definite is put for an indefinite. That's how synecdoche works in Scripture. I won't be able to make it to Proverbs, but let's go over a couple of quick rules for synecdoche. They're a whole lot like metonymy. Context is always the key. Remember that numbers can sometimes take the form of a synecdoche. The Bible will tell us when numbers are literal or not. We always know when the numbers are figurative or whether they're literal. And then... Common sense often reveals the use of synecdoche. So if I'm reading a passage and I know more is intended, I'm probably looking at a synecdoche where a part is being put for the whole, something like that. I love those in Scripture. It is a very efficient way of communicating much more information. So you have to appreciate the wisdom of God and the way that he did that. All right, we're going to put a peg in it here. We'll pick up and we'll cover the very last part of Lesson 12, but we'll also start Lesson 13 next time. And we are just going to quickly go over Proverbs. I think they're probably easier figures of speech in the Bible because they're just so practical and so evident as to what they're trying to teach. We'll pick up with Proverbs. We'll go to Lesson 13. And after we get done with that, then we'll move on to some other things. I want to talk about manners and customs. When you see references to ancient cultural practices. How how do we understand those things? Because obviously culture has changed. So how do we how do we understand culture and the references to culture from a time long ago? 
We're going to talk about that coming up here pretty soon. So next week, next lesson, lesson 13, we're going to finish up lesson 12. I bid you farewell. Hey, thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. I love you. God loves you even more than I do. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate you tuning in. Keep on doing it. Give us a thumbs up. Subscribe. Share. We'll see you next time.